Hi guys, welcome back to the channel. Today I have with me Rob Jones. Uh, again, I will explain to you what it means again. <laughs> the first recording was not very successful. Um, Rob is here because obviously among other things, he's the author of uh, quite new rule set that has been uh, out in the community called um, Blood and Horse Droppings, amongst other things. Hi Rob, thank you so much for joining me. No, my pleasure. And um, we're going to discuss about the rules. Uh, obviously, this is the most important part and uh, any other subject that uh, Rob wants. Rob, if you can give, you know, a, a quick resume about yourself and, uh, you know, so the guys know uh, how did you, I mean, um, uh, enter this war game rules uh, design uh, thing. And uh, then we're going to go to the mechanics and the specifics of the rules that uh, many people are asking me from the channel. Sure. Um... So I've been wargaming since I was, what, 14, 15. Um, and actually quite lucky to get into a, um, a very well-established wargames club. So my background is not the sort of traditional Warhammer fantasy battles and then finding historical stuff. I started on historical stuff and dallied with Warhammer fantasy battles before kind of moving in and out of it later. Um, so I was surrounded by quite well established war gamers, lots of different periods. So that was all great. Um, lots of different ways of looking at gaming as well. Some of them very traditional sort of 1970s WRG type stuff. But also I was very fortunate, a couple of long standing friends who are quite innovative in the way in which they understand war gaming. And that, that worked really well for me. Um, so yeah, I've been war gaming for a very long time now. Um, and then um, in my other life, not that there's much distinction between the two, I'm a medieval historian. Okay. So um, after after wargaming, I became a reenactor. Um, very quickly <laughs> after starting wargaming, I joined I joined the sealed not as what seems like most most reenactors in the UK start there and then sort of go off to other things. Um, but I spent a long time with the sealed not um, and James Wardlaw's dragoons. Um, and then um, a few years later, went on to university. Um, I went to study history at Cardiff University, um, fell in love with the medieval period. So by the third year, no, I was doing nothing but medieval history, um, was persuaded to do my master's degree there, um, and then went on to do a PhD. So mm -hmm. my doctorate was on display on the medieval battlefield. Um, that's now a long a long standing book bloody banners martial display on the medieval battlefield available in all good bookstores um and i've continued to be <laughs> i've continued to be an academic so i continue to research i continue to write i work for a, a an independent study abroad program based in bath called advanced studies in england that bring american undergraduates over so i teach um amongst other things i teach courses on castles i teach courses on chivalry so medieval warfare medieval history has been part of my life both as a hobby and as as a job um, for a, a long time. Um, I found though that when I was wargaming it, the sorts of games I was playing, and particularly when it came to the big battle rules, they weren't quite doing it for me. I wasn't getting the kind of battles on the tabletop that I was reading about in the source material. Um, and they just seemed to lack something about my understanding of what medieval warfare looked like. Um, and so I played around with various different sets of rules um, and then finally decided actually the only way to do this was to effectively come up with my own. Um, so Blood and Horse Droppings is the end of quite a long process of looking for a medieval set of rules and then finding, finding some that kind of do the job and then pinching the best bits, um, adding some of my own stuff and then what you have, um, what you have is what I think produces a pretty good set of high to late medieval um, mass battle rules that make sense for medieval warfare as I understand it. Yeah, well, this, uh, I'll just say a couple of things from what you told me. This the re reenacting uh, hobby, it's a subject on its own, I can imagine. We can have a different chapter this. I'm really interesting. I have many questions. Um, and um, obviously, you have an unfair advantage in what way, being a historian and medieval historian and you're having my dream job. I wish I would play like this. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's, that was, I mean, my dream job would have been to be a medieval historian in the UK. But um, you understand from the books you read and from your research and from all your studies, 
how actual medieval warfare was. You have an, an advantage in this for many other writers of rules who, uh, you know, uh, could be just, you know, uh, in the hobby, but not with the knowledge you have. So uh, your rules, if, if uh, your, your rules obviously come from experience and that makes them very interesting to me, from someone who knows how medieval warfare is. And um, I can imagine all these innovations you have in the rules I'm gonna discuss very soon uh, are part of your knowledge, your, your, your knowledge of medieval history. That's why you, you did the rules as you did. Um, now, uh, Blood and Horse Droppings is a very interesting title. Uh, how it came about, and then let's start uh, with um, going on the rules, uh, your mechanics, your philosophy behind them. You have a very interesting system uh, that we discussed before when we had a chat. Um, just try and, uh, and uh, give an idea uh, of, to the viewers how the rules work and the philosophy behind them. Sure. Um, so the name, the title first. Um, that came about funnily enough because of the book of the PHB, because of Bloody Banners. Mm -hmm. um, it was reviewed by a very prestigious uh, medieval military historian um, who I won't name. Um, but at the end of his review, which was on the whole very favorable, he said it was, it was a, a very worthwhile book, blah, blah, blah. Good things, bad things, as most of these reviews do. But he ended with the line of, there is rather too much pomp and ceremony in this book and not enough blood and horse droppings. And that last okay. phrase stuck with me, and so that's what I thought. Right, that's what my war games rules are going to be called. Um, so yeah, so they come out of a they come out of a review of a book, which was just very nice. Um, so yeah, you're right. Most of this stuff does, or most of the way in which the rules work, come out of what I understand to be medieval warfare and how it works. And I think the reason for doing that is that most war games rules in themselves come out of. And I may be doing people a disservice here, and I apologize to any other rules designers who have a different way of thinking. But a lot of them come out of a well-established tradition of what war games rules should be and what um, various elements of a war game should look like. So my, my longstanding tradition is that medieval warfare is understood traditionally by medieval histor military historians who traditionally learnt military history from... 19th century military historians who were seeking to tell us how war worked in the modern world by looking at past examples. So in the staff colleges of Frederick the Great and in Sandhurst and things like that, what they were trying to do was to distill the, um, the universal laws of war by looking at examples from the past. And the only way to do that was to try and understand those examples from the past in the culture of the present. Do you see what I mean? So, you know, when you're looking at what light cavalry are doing, uh, what hobbelars are doing on the battlefield, for example, you try and understand what a hobbelar is and what its role is by equating it to the nearest thing you have in your own period, which is generally light cavalry, hussars, drago light dragoons, that sort of thing, light skirmish cavalry. And so this idea about sort of shaping the medieval experience to fit a modern one works from a military history viewpoint. And I think it also works from a medieval, uh, from a war game viewpoint. Again, because war game sort of comes out of that same stable. You know, they're reading those books, using those as the basis for war games rules. Most war games rules actually come out of a tradition of 19th century sort of horse and musket rules that are then adapted, even though they're you know, increasingly adapted over time. The problem with that is actually that culturally medieval warfare is so different from 19th century warfare. Well, just in the way it it works, um, the nuts and bolts of it, but actually in the way that the um, the troops are raised, the way that the armies are organized, the way in which the commanders and the soldiers themselves think and behave, all comes out of a culture that is definitely not 19th century modern, modern military. And so I've been trying to pull back to what the primary sources are telling me about warfare, and therefore that the rules should reflect not so much the um, actions of medieval warfare but a culture of medieval warfare and i'm quite keen on that cultural aspect of war um the way in which warriors think the way in which they behave is shaped by the culture they're part of um so yeah so the rules fit that very well so there are a number of things um the first thing is that when you if you look at my rules you'll find that the units are not organized by troop type 
in that you do not have separate units of men at arms, uh, archers, crossbows, spears. Instead, they're organized by the way in which they are raised. So you have, um, and depending on whether you're looking at, so um, you have different types of company unit, depending on whether you're looking at Wars of the Roses or the Hundred Years' War, which are the two, um, the two periods that the rules really cover. So you will have um, retinue companies in the Wars of the Roses, which are your, you know, the captain, his men at arms, and the archers from his household around him. And similarly, although with a slightly different emphasis for the Hundred Years' War, you have in the English armies, you have hearse companies, which are the same thing. This is the late, late Hundred Years' War where um, captains are raising men at arms and archers together as indentured companies. And my take on this is that they are not being separated out on the battlefield. They're being, they are serving and fighting together because that's the cohesion of the unit. Um, to pull apart, as some people would suggest, the archers from the men at arms and station the archers somewhere else on the field destroys all of the unit cohesion, um, the command and control, the relationship between the captain and his men that you've you've got in that unit. And I just doesn't make logical sense to me. So that's the first thing. Um, so you've then got other types of companies. So you will have um, for the French, you do have men at arms companies because they raise their armies differently. They have whole companies who are nothing but. Uh, fully armoured knights, whether they're knights or sergeants or, 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 or sort of gentry just in full armour, mounted or dismounted. And then the crossbows are a separate company. Um, urban militias have a mixture of spears and crossbows. So you kind of get the sense. We're not looking at the, um, the equipment they're carrying does not solely determine the type of unit that you've got in your, in your body. So that's the first thing. Um, second thing is the, the commanders, so your captains and your ward commanders, the commanders of those sections, those divisions, if you like, of the, of the army, they are integrated into units. So around them, they have, it may be a company of men at arms, it may be a retinue company, but they have troops around them and they are fighting right down on the front lines with the men. They are putting themselves at risk. There are very few medieval commanders that had the ability to be able to stand back in the way that a general could do and issue orders and control the battle from behind they invariably almost invariably had to get involved at some point the armies just aren't large enough to kind of keep that kind of reserve back in that way so you're always going to have your commanders with a unit around them so that's the second thing um armies are really difficult to maneuver so the units are big. So my base size is my unit is 150 mil by 100 mil. Um, this is for 28 mil figures. If you wanted to change that's fine, but a three wide by two deep ratio is the way to go. They are big blocks and they move ponderously. So you can't whip around the battlefield with small units and to, to grab a flank or anything like that. Medieval armies don't deal with that. Most medieval battles are actually pretty tedious. Um, you, know, you line up, you approach your enemy, you shoot at them, and when you think you've got an advantage, you charge. But there's very little opportunity for um, sneaking maneuvers around the flank, big, wide flanking envelopments, that sort of thing, just don't tend to, and there are always exceptions, but they don't tend to happen yeah. on the medieval field. So again, for blood and horse droppings, the armies are chunky and slow moving and ponderous. All of that means that actually the opportunities for decision making on the battlefield are quite limited. And this is where, for me, games are most interesting is when the players are asked to make decisions, where you've got choices. Um, now, if your armies are ponderous and not particularly well trained and you don't, your commander is right down on the front lines and doesn't have a sort of a, a good tactical vision or indeed lots of runners that can go and change orders, then the opportunities for a player to make decisions and, and change the way the battle is running is very, well, at least in the traditional way, it just doesn't happen. You just don't have the ability to get, decide necessarily, oh, I'm suddenly going to move a division in, or I've got these supports that I can rely on, or suddenly, you know, I'm going to spring this ambush. So for these rules, I needed to put in a decision-making process. There's got to be somewhere where you can get your teeth into a really good game, something that's got a bit of to and fro, something where you can try and outwit your opponent. And for that, that's where the melee comes in. Um, and we'll go into the melee in perhaps more detail later, but there's a, the, the focus of the game really is on those melee rules. 
So you maneuver your troops into position. Yes, you can hold them back a little bit. You choose perhaps when they go in. But the main part of it all, the most interesting part for me and the most exciting part is when you get into melee and you're fighting down on that front line. And that's where the decision making process comes in and the choices are. Um, other than that, I think that's pretty much the kind of those are the big things about the rules that are partly different and also that reflect my understanding of how medical warfare worked. No, you. Um, we're going to go into Malay uh, in a little bit more detail because um, uh, you have all these uh, cards and characteristics of uh, also of commanders. I, I want to go. You know, I had um, many years of channel here, and uh, I've had discussions with viewers. And many players are very interested in the command and control part of the game. Uh, obviously, melee shooting is very important, but many, uh, many, many, many players are asking, "How is the command and control?" Uh, can you give me a brief uh, example of how the command and control system is uh, and uh, your rules, how it works, how you give orders? Uh, mm -hmm. You have also, from uh, a quick read I had uh, last week, uh, interruptions, like uh, opportunities that from the opponent that it can interrupt your strategy. Very interesting concept. Uh, so can you give me an idea of the command and control and how it works? Yeah, command and control in these rules is, again, slightly different from a traditional it's sort of I go, you go, but not quite. Um, the origins of it come out of a, uh, a game developed by a friend of mine, Steve Jones, the, the War Game 1632, which is based around uh, the Thirty Years' War and the English Civil War. Um, and the idea is that um, your ward commander, so the chap in charge of perhaps a third of your army, so a brigade, division, ward, battle, whatever you want to call it, um, he has a number of companies under his control, including his own, um, and he may try and command those by rolling to activate him, them. The activation roll is based on the quali his quality, and you might have a bigger dice, so a 10-sided dice for a good quality commander, an 8-sided dice for an average quality commander, or perhaps a 6-sided dice for one who's a bit of a duffer, um, a poor quality commander. And you need a 4 or better. If you're successful, then your that company, the company you activate, can perform three actions. They may do three things. If you're unsuccessful, that company and every company you haven't yet activated may only do one thing in that turn. So okay, what I get you. is that little bit of friction. So basically the commander has a certain amount that he can, can control, he can pay attention to, and you can narrate, and I'm quite keen on building a narrative around these events. You know, the narrative might be that he runs out of people to shout at, or his, his concentration is focused on something else, or just the troops are a bit slow to respond, or whatever. Um, but that's how that bit works. So you start performing your actions, and this can be uh, a movement action, a shooting action, a rally, a melee, a number of different things you might do. And you can do them in any order you like. So you can move three times in a turn if you have three actions, or you can move, shoot, and move again, or move and melee, or rally, or whatever. So you get the idea. When you Before you perform an action, your opponent can try and seize the initiative, steal the initiative from you. And so they roll against their quality commander's quality dice. And, there's a, um, and there are a number of um, modifiers to this. But if they manage to seize the initiative, one of their companies close to your activating company may do one thing okay. in, your, in, your, in your turn. And then they pick up a marker. So they're borrowing time from their own turn, if you, turn, if you like. So when, when it becomes their activation, that interrupting company, the first thing it must do is to remove the marker for the interruption, the stealing of the initiative. So there's a really interesting little um, dynamic there. And again, this is back to where, you, where players get to make decisions and make choices about whether you take the risk of trying for an interrupt, whether you, um, when you do what, what it is you do, what it is you steal, how far you allow your opponent to perform actions before you do so. So there's a bit of part gamesmanship in there in terms of being able to judge the right moment to try and grab the initiative if you can. Um, so that's basically, and that's the core of how um, command and control works. So your captains um, may activate, tr roll to activate, your troops may do three things or they may only do one thing. When you finish one ward, your opponent gets to do a ward and then back and forth until you've both done all of your wards and then the turn ends. In this game, you have... Um, 
just sorry, just counting up, eight turns. Um, so the battle will only ever last eight turns. They're based okay. around in this little medieval conceit. They're based around the um, what are referred to as the canonical hours. So these were the, the way in which the day was divided up by the medieval church was divided into eight fragments. Matins, which is just be, which is sort of middle of the night. Uh, Lords, which is about dawn. Prime, which is the first hour. Tears, the third hour. Sex, the sixth hour. Nonus, the ninth hour. Vespers, which is the end of the evening. And then Compline, which is after dark. Um, so your battle lasts between those phases. So your Matins turn is when you get to organize your ambushes. Um, move your troops around, perhaps lose troops if some of your captains are not as um, trustworthy, which of course is a, is a major thing for the Wars of the Roses. You may set up your army and find one yeah. of your companies actually has decided they don't fancy fighting today. And then you play through the other six turns, which takes you down through to Vespers, which is kind of towards the end of the day as the dusk is setting. And then you get a chance, if you want to, to try for a compline turn, so a late turn in the game. So if it's kind of on a knife edge and you think one more turn might win it for you, you can roll to try and take that. And your opponent can roll to prevent you if they choose to. So there's kind of bit of a game there as well. But you've got a limited amount of time. Now, the reason for that is um, it stops players just standing off and shooting at each other, which is yeah. always... Um, you know, because you've got a limited amount of time, you can't just spend the whole day stood at the back, letting arrows go through at each other. At some point, someone's got to make a decision and try and force the game. And so I think that, again, changes some of the command and control choices you have. So, yeah, so there's command and control. Yeah, that's that's great. And it's nice because it it, it sounds, it sounds, it is because it, it's more interactive than just waiting for someone to do his actions. Um, you may interrupt in the wrong time and lose a move that it's crucial during your activation. So mm -hmm. you need to know when you get it. So it gives a very interesting strategic option that um, you don't sit down, have your coffee or beer or a cigarette and wait for your opponent to play. You need to be, you need to see his moves and you need to be active and, uh, you know, checking when you can interrupt, if you can interrupt. So that's, a, that's really interesting, I, said, I would say. Now, every it's commander... Really Sorry, it was really yeah. important because when in an early iteration of um, the war game rules, when we were trying these out, we mm. didn't have that interrupt mechanism. And what we did yeah. find was players were stood back watching this all happen to them without any sense that they could do anything in return. So, yeah. Now, I share the screen. Can we see it, uh, Rob? Yeah, I've got it. Now, now, these are your commanders. I put it so the guys can see. So, uh, you have commanders, the Azure commanders, and obviously, um, anyone if he can understand your if when you read the roles understand the concept behind them you can you can design your own commanders but um can we go a bit and discuss about for example you have now let's go forget him if let's go to marshal busico so mm -hmm. you say it's lordly quality is an old soldier so he does a d10 and trades uh, race from the dust minus one to all activation roles i understand this and if I, if I pronounce it correctly, it's Puissant receives two um, WDs warded uh, war dice. Uh, war dice if putting himself to the hazard as combat tactic, choosing the most advantageous. Can you give me a, So this is a very interesting uh, command card, but can you explain it to me? Sure. So each of your, um, certainly all your ward commanders will have a card, should have a card like this or a roster like this. I mean, if you, you know, the cards are available to download alongside the rules. There are blanks yeah. there if you want to fill them out for yourself. So that sort of thing. Um, the idea is so the rank is their status within society. Um, now, this is something that I picked up from um, the other set of rules that were a big influence on me, which is um, a coat of steel and a crown of paper. Yep. which are the um, Wars of Roses rules written by the Perfect Captain team. Um, and they have similar, they have similar setup. That rank is really important because, of course, in medieval society, you don't take command because you're the best commander. You take command because you sit higher in the social hierarchy than those beneath you. That's true. That's so true. you have to, in the end, the, your ward commanders are going to be the men who insist that they have the right to lead. Whether or not they're actually good at it, whether or not you know they could be in their 80s and a little bit slow off the mark, but because they are you know a a duke, um, they lord it over someone who is slightly further down the line. Um, yeah. So that's the first thing. So that's what rank does is it tells you who you should be putting first and who should be commanding your wards. Quality is this. Um, 
this is your your command quality. So it's basically it's how quick you are to take the initiative, how good you are at rallying off your um, your um, troops um, disorder, what we've referred to as black flags, um, and all the other things that are done according to the qualities of being a commander. Um, so this is where you can have a poor commander is a, is a D6, a good commander is a D8, an old soldier, someone who's either well experienced or just has a natural ability, they'll be a D10. So they, they're quite standard. So that's the next thing. So all of your commanders have rank and quality. Um, and that could be your war commanders. It could be men within your companies as well. So your company leader may well be a character in his own right. So even if he's not commanding the ward, he's still there, he's still present, and these things still have an impact. Traits uh, were, are an attempt to give them something that feels like uh, a real character, a real sense of who these people were. And this has been quite fun for me as a medieval historian, the idea of researching these people to get a sense of who they were, how they might have thought, what sort of things make them stand out was quite fun. Um, so in the case of Marshal Busico, um, Race from the Dust, he was, he was not a great baron, he was not of the royal blood which in French terms meant that actually he was looked down upon, particularly by a lot of the senior commanders, all of whom were connected to the royal family. You know, they were either um, younger sons, cousins, nephews, whatever, but they, that sense of being of the blood royal, as they would have put it, set them above this man who is a marshal <laughs> in France. You know, he was the, the leading military commander, but actually when it came to getting them to do stuff, very often they wouldn't, they were less prepared to listen to him because of his lowly social status. True, that's very true. So that's what the minus one to his activation rolls does. Yeah, he, the people don't listen to him because he's a bit common. Not very common, but a bit common. The second one, the Puissant thing, this is about his quality as a military man, quality as a, as a warrior himself personally. And there are certain um, commanders who were powerful, strong, um, excellent fighters. Now, Marshal Busico, he's the guy who used to run a mile in his armor, could um, shit, climb up the underside of ladders, could vault, vault in onto his horse unaided. Well, at least that's what his biographer tells us, but we'll go with it for now. Yeah, we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll play with, we'll live up to his, um, yeah. to, to the story. So he clearly was someone who had a good, you know, was a was a good warrior. I mean, the other example would be um, the Duke of York in the Wars of the Roses. Uh, very, again, very powerful man, very important, very good warrior. So they get this poisson technique, and what that does is mean that when they come to be involved in combat, they give an extra added bonus because of the quality the they bring as a, as an individual combatant. Um, over and above. So that's why that happens. And there are a whole range of different um, elements, yeah. some of which are connected to when it's Wars of the Roses, then might, you've got some who refer to um, that are trimmers, so they're a little less keen to come forward. There are a couple who are completely untrustworthy, who might just turn around and leave the battlefield the first time they sort of have to face up to a fight, that sort of thing. So there's a whole range of those in there. The rules list them. So as you say, you can actually pick and choose, do your own research, find your own commanders, or indeed roll them randomly if you don't want to follow a historical example and, and, and pull them together in that way. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, you can obviously you can make your own commanders, and also it's it, it, it's like role play game. Also, you know, you have characters there who maybe maybe depending on your strategy, you choose a different commander. Uh, mm -hmm. What you said before regarding um, uh, commanders not being followed because they were not high born. This was why probably the French lost in Agincourt because Charles d'Albert and Marshal Boussico were not of royal blood, and all the other king princes uh, were to call and gone, and they ignored mm -hmm. them. And the yeah, same when you combine that, sorry, when you yeah. combine that with the fact that they're also desperately keen to get into the fray, desperately exactly. keen to fight the English, those two yeah. things mean any sense, any real sense of um, military propriety goes right out the window. Which, of course, yeah. is what want to, and this is what's really difficult about medieval warfare is so many of the decisions that are made, so many of the things that happen, do not make sort of sound military sense. And so getting players to do that sort of thing, getting players to role play those characters is really tricky. So what I'm, I hope is that those cards help to give the player a kind of sense of how they should be playing their, yeah. you know, playing their army so that they, they play in a more medieval way. 
Mm -hmm. No, the, the great idea and the traits are nice. And I found out just to for just parenthesis um, when I was when I'm doing my campaign here, and I was uh, my commanders are Robert Knowles and Sir Hugh Calverley. Uh, I read about them, and uh, basically they were butchers killing people. But because they were low born, but they managed to rise, they lost many battles because their soldiers didn't follow their orders because they were they thought they were not they were not too high born to give orders, and that's crazy. I mean, there's two great commanders, but at, in the end, they lost quite a few battles. I read. I'm not. Yeah, much. no, it, it seems to be the case. You know, Knowles, Knowles is Chevrochet, one of the few campaigns which doesn't have one of the English royal family leading it, yeah. struggles. He struggles from very early on keeping his yeah. army together. And that's got to be, it's not about his ability. He was a very experienced and grounded military man. Yeah. But it's got to be about the fact that he just did not have sufficient social standing to keep them together and to stop them just going, oh, we don't have to listen to you. You're, you're exactly. no better than us, if not yeah. actually no more. So, yeah. And this is what happened, actually. Um, so we have the we have the command and control. It's very interesting. We we have the orders now. The guys understood the traits of the commanders, and then um, we go to the actual action where it's uh, shooting and hand-to-hand -hand combat. Um, you have uh, some special dice uh, that are used, and I will share them now with the guys so um, you can um, just uh, give us an example of uh, uh, how they use, what are they for, and um, we can we can talk about the remaining mechanics of the game. So yeah, go yeah. on. I'll, I'll share it now. Just give me a second. So the, the, we refer to them as as war dice. Um, and again, this is this is something that came out of um, the war game. So the this thirty years war set of rules, and it's a I've just brought it across. Um, so this is a six sided dice, but rather than having numbers, it has a series of icons. Yeah. And so if you look can across you them. That? Yeah, I can see them. So you can okay. see here um, from left to right, and you've got two sets running across there. From left to right, you've got cross swords, which is a bonus, which um, plays out in certain combat elements. You have a horse, which is when your opponent, when you're um, attacking um, a cavalryman, that counts as a wound. You then have a coin, which is um, what we refer to as fate. Now you can collect these as tokens, which you can then spend to augment dice rolls for things like seizing the initiative, rallying off disorder, that sort of thing. Yeah. The next one, the black flag is is black flag, and this is an indicator of disorder in uh, causing disorder on an opponent. And then you have an archer for foot, and then the really odd looking thing is an artillery piece, so gun. So you've got a horse, foot, and gun for causing casualties. A black flag. For causing disorder, a fate which gives you a coin to spend in augmenting command and control decisions, and then the bonus, which can, depending on the combat you're dealing with and depending on the circumstances of the combat, can either count as a casualty or a black flag or may not count at all. And so those are the six sides. Now you can play that with a D6 and just call it one, two, three, four, five, and six, mm -hmm. as long as you know what those numbers refer to. So if one is a bonus, two is a cavalryman, three, you get the idea, then it's fine yeah. and it works. Um, but I found, and we found in both, our, both these sets of rules, that there's something really, really interesting happens to a war gamer's head when you take away the numbers and they suddenly stop calculating what they need to roll so you stop getting that, well, what do I need? Do I need sixes? Do I need fives? Yeah, do I need... Yeah. And they suddenly start thinking about the game, thinking about the story, and they get more involved in that. So when they start thinking, oh, I've caused lots of disorder, I've caused two disorder and a casualty on you, suddenly you're in the game rather than playing the game. And it just has been really interesting to watch, even with the most um, competitive and sort of calculating the mathematical player, they stop thinking in that way and it just shifts. And that's been quite great. I love I love seeing that happen to people and doing that. So yeah, so that's what the war dice do. Um, when so are they you, used, these dice? When do you roll these dice, in which cases? Them, you use them in um, both shooting and melee combat. And you also use them when you're determining what happens to your commander in, in combat. So if he's if his company is hit by archery and you and your opponent scores two or more kills so two or more wounds then you have to roll one of those dice to see what your captain does now it's possible he gets an arrow in the face and he's out it's possible that he's kind of 
discomforted, he's knocked to the ground, or he loses his nerve for a moment, or something like that. So you can s sort of play with those things. So again, back to that character element, your commander can find himself suddenly, he's right in the thick of it, he's at risk all the time. Um, so yeah, or in, so that happens when he's being shot at. It happens in melee, particularly if he puts himself to the hazard. He puts himself right in the front line. And it also happens if your if your company disappears from the field. If they break and run, there's always a possibility that in the um, the chaos, he's um, accidentally stabbed multiple times, um, trampled underfoot, something like that. So again, those things all feed into that narrative play. Like, uh, I give you an example, like Henry Percy in Shrewsbury. He opened his visor to see what was happening. He was winning the battle. He was very close to the king. And then an arrow killed him, correct? Yep. And yep. suddenly and that, course, that was the end. This young, young Henry himself, so the future Henry V, also gets an arrow in the face at that battle. Um, yep. He's lucky enough that he's got a good surgeon who can withdraw it. Um, I just love the idea that all these very pretty actors playing Shakespeare's Henry V, yeah. all of them have a really big round yeah. right in here where the arrow came out. Um, but yeah, yeah, the risks to commanders, and we hear, I mean, in the Wars of the Roses, a number of commanders that wind up dead on the field or take arrows in the face because they remove parts of their armor, that sort of thing is again, quite yeah. hard. So yeah, you really, you, your commanders are always at risk. Yeah, it's very funny that you mention it before we go to the next uh, discussion and we'll talk about the melee is that uh, you see all these movies regarding uh, medieval knights fighting, you know, crusades, and you see all these actors who are in their late 40s or early 40s or 50s, and they portray people who were 20. We don't realize that these guys were 19, 20, 17, and maybe in Agincourt, Henry was 30. You know, they were children. In, yeah, they're still relatively young. I mean, they're not because they've grown, you know, they grow, that, that yeah, they grow differently. grew up faster. But yeah, I mean, the vast majority of them are in their 20s, their 30s, teens, 20s, 30s. I mean, Black Prince at Cressy is barely 16. Yeah. Um, but you do get some older commanders. So um, William Marshall, if we go right back to the 12th century, William Marshall is commanding troops in his in his final battle at Lincoln after after the death of King John. He's kind of wiping out the last of the sort of baronial rebels. He's in his 70s. He's leading cavalry charges at the age of 70. Um, yeah, which is quite remarkable. But yeah, so yeah. but you're right. The majority of these commanders are relatively young men. Young boys. We've got a whole. There's a there's a whole different issue about um, movie medieval history movies and what they portray and accuracy. We have to discuss this. We'll come. You'll come again. We have sure. time, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do another one. We'll do another one. You. We, we have to do it, and we'll have to talk about reenactment. So we go. Let's go now to the hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat. Mally, that's very interesting. Now, uh, as we discussed before, uh, you uh, you based your ideas on the perfect captain ideas that you can use predetermined strategies. And depending mm -hmm. what your opponent is using, the result will be different. You can be aggressive, you can be defensive, you can, uh, you, and different results come out of this. And you, we have cards that um, the commanders are using. Uh, and as I said, I don't want to repeat myself, depending on the strategy you have in your mind, and the condition your unit is, you act accordingly. Can you give us a little bit of detail? And I will share the cards now. Uh, and, uh, mm. Sure. Um, okay, so when, when you engage in melee, um, company by company, um, you select, at the point at which you engage in melee, you select from one of six tactical choices. And you're right, this, um, this idea came from the perfect captain. Um, and they're very heavily card-driven rules. Um, and so they had a series of these, these tactical choices. And what I've done is adapt that to fit with the, the dice mechanisms from the war game and then tweak can you see the screen? screen. You can see the screen. Yeah. So you've got, as you can see, um, you're looking at the cards side by side. You have um, a pack of six defender tactics and six attacking tactics. Now the tactics have the same name, so they both have a with drag daggers drawn, they both have a put myself to the hazard, but depending on whether you're the attacker or the defender, the way it reads is slightly different. So what you do is you, um, you line up the troops, you calculate, you then select a tactic, um, and it could be with daggers drawn, which means you're going in at close order. So, you know, your, your men at arms are going in hard. All your archers are drawing their daggers and trying to hamstring the opponents. And you're, you're really, the idea is to kind of cause as much disorder and destruction to your opponent as possible. 
the quid pro quo to that is that you're likely to take more casualties. So you're going to lose men because you're going in so hard. Um, you can choose to put yourself to the hazard, which means that your commander goes in in the front rank, leading his men, adding his the weight of his presence and his quality as a, as a warrior to the to the battle. The quid pro quo to that, of course, is that he has a greater chance of getting killed whilst he's there. Um, I'll come to stand off a pace in a moment. There are a couple of others, one of which is um, gather to the standards. What that does is it allows you to try and roll off disorder, which we've kind of hinted at, um, before combat starts. So if your company is disordered when the, when the enemy comes in, or if you're charging disordered, then you've got an opportunity to remove some of that disorder before you go into battle. The corollary to that is you're less likely to cause casualties on your opponent. Um, and so that's the various things. The one slightly odd one is, um, so thrust home lads is, if you like, that's vanilla combat. That's you going in as, you know, I'm fighting hard, but just in a very sort of standard way. So that's, if you like, that's the mid ground. Um, the one uh, called standoff a pace is the only way you can disengage from combat. That's interesting. I like this. I don't believe that once companies got into hand-to-hand -hand combat, they found it very easy to be able to step away. So the idea of breaking off from an opponent and making enough space to be able to do something else, whether it's to shoot or to charge back in or even to withdraw, I think that has to be really difficult. And so for me, what you have to do is you have to fight a round of combat using this particular tactic. What that means is at the end of it, if everything goes right, you'll fall back and move, you'll have enough space to be able to do something different. But you're much more likely actually to be caught up, probably pick up more disorder, possibly more casualties, or maybe not be able to break off at all and your opponent may follow up. But that's how that kind of works. So it just can be used, it can be used to break off entirely. If you're slightly unlucky, it may be that what you do is just manage to blunt your opponent's attack a little bit, that sort of thing. So those are your six tactics. Mm -hmm. And what you do is you count up how many combat dice, how many war dice, excuse me, your um, your company has, and that will vary depending on the type of company it is. Um, it will depend on whether you're uh, uphill from your opponents, whether you're of a better quality from your opponent, whatever. Um, you then determine how many, what the bonuses are, so what the bonus modifiers are. That may end up giving you more dice. So you might start off with two dice, and then you get a bonus because you're charging, and then get a third dice for charging, and then you might get another one because you're of a better quality troop than your opponent, or better, you stand slightly higher in the ranking. So you end up rolling four dice for that. If you're commander, then depending on your tactical choice, you might end up with another dice because your commander's involved. And so you roll this handful of dice. You work out how many casualties you've got. According to the tactical choices, you work out whether those the bonus results you have are casualties, black flags, or if the bonus doesn't count anyway. And then you act out those. So your opponent will receive casualties. They'll receive black flags and be pushed back and disordered. Um, and then at the end of that, there might be a chance of you taking a casualty for yourself or you may have to roll for something else. So there's then a sort of post-combat phase. If you've pushed your opponent back, there's a pretty good chance you're going to fight again using the same tactics. So there's a kind of follow-up phase. Follow-up, yeah. One follow-up within that action. And that's how combat sort of sits and works. Um, there are a couple of examples. I've got played out examples in, in the rules. So it sounds much more complicated. I've made it sound more complicated. No, no, no. But you, I have to say, yeah, I have to say, and I will share this again. So for, uh, for the viewers, um, is that um, the, your um, rules have um, so many examples that everything is cleared very easily. So I'm sorry, I'm scrolling. So mm -hmm. everything you have here, so for example, example of movement and interpenetration, it's something that many rules are missing. You have photographs, it's very easy for someone to understand. The rules are quite simple in a way that they're explained. And there is always, always examples of, um, a, a bit further down if we go from the yeah, it's here. Day, it's yeah, yeah, example of shooting combat, here you have your dice. Uh, Mm -hmm. and, uh, and you have examples of uh, hand fan combat and you show the pad. So I have to say that it's very easy to understand the rules and they work well. And I'm going to do for fight a battle report very soon. I have to find time to go and print this, I think. These <laughs> things. And um, I will fight very soon a battle report because I like the idea. Now, what I like is to, I won't try to make understand the viewers that you can use any base um, you have uh, I, I, as long as you said it's three to two, correct? Yeah. Yeah, so I use 150 mil by 100 mil 
basis with about a dozen to 16 figures on, but you can cram as many on as you like. So you can see there are two companies facing each other in combat. Um, and the mix up, the, the makeup of figures is whatever you like, as long as it's clear what that company represents. So obviously in there, you'll see that the, the middle two bases in each case have men at arms. Uh, yeah. So you've got some armored guys, you've got a couple of guys with bills because it's the Wars of the Roses. There are, you know, and then there are archers around them because that's what a retinue company is. It's a mixture of men at arms and archers. Um, and so we, I'm using 150 by 100 because that makes a nice, it just works with the figures I had. Frankly, you could cram more figures on the bases. You could use 15 mil figures, six mil figures. Actually, I must admit, as part of me would love if I was a fast enough painter to do a six mil army with the same size bases because the companies would almost be one to one at that point. Yeah. Which would look stunning. Um, but if you've got a smaller table, fewer figures, it doesn't matter. The reason for saying that you've got to have a base that's three, uh, that's three wide by two deep in that proportion is because if you've got a really sneaky, slightly um, rules mongerish opponent, you can actually, if you change it, if you make the base a little bit deeper, you can actually wheel up the table faster than you can march. Um, and it just stops people playing, playing sneakily with the, with the way in which the rules are designed. It's a, it's a, a it must be a geometry thing. I don't get geometry. I'm a medieval historian. Um, but yeah, so that's that's the only reason. But frankly, whatever you've got, get them on the table and and give the, and the rules work because you're dealing with basis. There's no figure removal. So that's we good. use I use little casualty counters, you know, the little turning um, things to mark casualties. Um, okay. Black flags, which you just can see if you look at that picture there, you can see on the left hand side of that picture, there are two figures at the back there with black flags. Those are your disorder markers. So they show disorder. Now your units will take normally five casualties, but only three disorder. Okay. If they, if, once they have three disorder markers, they will break and they will run. So there are a couple of other things that it's really important. The first thing is you've got to use rally, rally actions. You've got to keep your men in good orders, otherwise you'll find they disappear from the field. Um, and the second thing is the unit will take far less disorder then it will take casualties so units are far more likely to run than they are to be shot to pieces um and i think that's a very medieval that fits very much with the way in which medieval armies work they are very brittle um in terms of their um morale and and cohesion so it's, they're far more likely to break up than they are to get shot shot away as it were so yeah yeah no i like the idea i have for example um my main armies back home are 40 by 40 bases. So I can see very easily having uh, four by two or uh, three, three by, by two, two would be Yeah, and have, uh, and have and uh, have my longbow bases on the sides and then uh, mix them and have a couple of, have three longbow bases and three men at arms bases. It's a very nice idea. I like it, the mixture of, um, of, uh, of the troops. That was actually what was happening. We didn't have, you know, it's not the Napoleonic times, the medieval era, yeah, that's true. It's not. I mean, no, I think one of the difficulties you're saying that I've got an advantage and I'm a medieval historian when it comes exactly. to medieval wargaming, I don't think so. Because um, the problem is I, I know how little we know and how uncertain we are about most medieval warfare. We don't really know how armies were formed. Um, so the thing I'm struggling with at the moment is um, Cressy. Um, I've yeah. got a blog, I've got a refight of Agincourt, of ways in which you can refight Agincourt using these rules. I've got suggested army lists. And I was going to do something for Cressy, and it was going to be really straightforward, I thought, because um, I've done it before. No, easy. No. Because not only um, do we have problems with the English army, <laughs> the English army is complicated. About half of it is made up of these indentured retinues. So this is where the captains have been told to raise a certain number of men at arms and a certain number of archers, and then they're brought together in sort of subcontracted units. So that's straightforward. That's fine. That's the Hearst companies. But that's only half the army. Another portion of the army are um, Southern French pro-English um, aristocracy. And they're almost certainly arriving as men at arm companies, the sort of thing you'd expect on the other side of the field from the French. Um, so that's something else you've got to think about. And they all seem to have been thrown in as part of the big household, the Edward, Edward III's royal household. So that's going to look very different from everything else that's out there. And the real pain is that you have a large number of Welsh spears and Welsh archers being raised. 
and they're being shipped across to France, but we have no idea at all about how they're being deployed on the battlefield. So we don't know if they're being deployed as blocks in their own right, whether they're being parceled out amongst the other uh, companies, or what no one tells us. And there's no mention of it when in any of the sources when we look at how the English army was formed. And so depending on who you read, and a lot of, um, a lot of historians of this battle have kind of looked at this and come up with their own ways. You could either field them as separate units of spears and bows, or you could field them, decide actually, no, they're just part of the, they've been thrown into the rest of new companies of local captains that they would know and recognize. And you have to try and work out who they may be. Um, and so you, you include them in the, the, the standard um, Hearst companies, or you do something in between, or maybe they were being held as part of Edward III's reserve with his already big household. So it may be that Edward III's household is a mixture of um, Hearst companies of men at arms and archers, um, pure men at arms, mounted men at arms from the French, and then um, spears and bows from Wales. And again, we're not sure whether the spears and bows were combined in units themselves, or whether you had separate bodies of spears and bows being raised, and quite how that worked. So there's a whole raft of really difficult things that we're just not sure. And I want to get it right. Yeah, and I can't I because I don't know. <laughs> so at some point I have to make a guess. So what it means is that when I come to write this up, and I will um, in the blog, there will be a lot of, well, if you feel this is the way it goes, then this is what the army should look like. But actually, if you think the spearmen were all separate because they were North Welsh and all of the longbowmen were South Welsh, don't believe that's the case, but just for argument, then you need to field an army that looks like this. And then what really tweaked everything was Michael Livingston's book, The Battle of the Three Kings, which is okay. Michael Livingston's book on Cressy, where not only is he looking again at the various armies, but he has looked again at the terrain, looked at the traditional well-established battlefield. It's been established since the 18th century and he's gone, I think it's the wrong field. And he argues very compel has very compelling arguments and evidence for placing the battle on a southern to the south of the town of Cressy rather than to the um, east. East, with yeah. Very different terrain, um, and with the English not standing in front of their wagon wagonberg. So the English army supposedly produces a wagon fort. Everyone said, "Well, that must be where they were keeping their their baggage," and then the army forms up in front of it. Again, he argues, and it's quite compelling that a lot of the army was actually behind. The wagons so they were actually behind effectively a wagon fort in the sort of way we might think of the hussites or something like that and yeah, that yeah. not only the way your army shapes but also the way the battle will fight and so suddenly i've got to offer not just one battle but two completely different battles yeah and that's that's really exciting but hugely frustrating as well yes that's very it's new you know I've, I've never heard about this before very interesting obviously there's so many things you can teach us and we can discuss about uh, hopefully we discuss this with your very busy man we're gonna do another chat again uh, but um, um, now regarding the rules and uh, before we close um, so the victory the victory conditions are uh, you have eight turns and then how do you decide the victor is it uh, points is it uh, can you just for our viewers you know um, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a believer in competition games and pickup games, really. I like a good narrative. I like a good scenario. So I would argue you know who wins because you've got a scenario in mind. They've got victory conditions, and it's whoever has achieved the victory conditions. Um, what that actually means is that most of the time it will be pretty obvious, as I say, that Medieval armies are quite brittle, your companies are quite brittle, yeah. and once things start to go wrong, there's a kind of cascade effect. So yeah. if you lose a commander or lose a company, you will end up taking a faltering check, which could see that company going back, not just an actions move, but a whole turns move. So that's nine inches if they're off foot and picking up disorder. And if one of those goes back, you may find that the next company to them and all the companies around them also have to take tests. So suddenly things start to crumble and the army will crumble and break. And I think more often than not, in six, seven turns, you'll see that and that will determine yeah. victory. Um, it's not the only way you can do it. Yes, you could apply points if you wanted to. So you could say, well, my men at arms companies are worth this much, or you could apply points to the captains and say, well, if this captain is lost, whether he's dead or captured or whatever, that's, you know, that's a point to me or whatever. Um, so you can play with that quite a bit. Um, the Agincourt game that I've got in the blog, I did something quite different there. We played that um, with a group of friends um, here in South Wales. Um, 
And what we decided was that because the English army is fairly static, they don't move very much. Um, all they do is stand and shoot is that we wouldn't give our visiting players an English command. So all three of the visiting players were given one of the French battles. And so they were set against each other. So it's a competitive game, but all of them were French and they were all given the objective of if you get here, if you do this, you'll gain a point. So if you're the first, if you're the first French commander into battle, gains you a point. If you're the first French commander to break an, an English or you get a point. If you capture the Duke of York, you get points. If you capture the King of England, you get points. So the idea was by making competitive between them, um, they could, you know, basically the person who won the battle was the one who got in fastest and did the most damage to the English. And that worked yeah. quite well. So there are all sorts of ways in which you can play with this. But as I say, it's not, you can do pickup games, you can do sort of just meeting engagements, balanced armies, whatever you like, that works, it's fine. The rules the rules are okay with that, but they're at their best when you're perhaps running a campaign or when you've got a good scenario in mind. But, and then your you're player, again, it's part of that narrative thing. It's about playing playing the game in a, in, a, in a storytelling way. That's how you know you've won because you've achieved the objectives you've been set yeah. up. That would be my, be my preference. Uh before you tell us, although we discussed the links of all your uh, web pages that will be on the description, just tell us where they can find the rules, where they can find you, what they can find in the uh, in the in your web page. It's very interesting with articles and everything. But before you tell us that, can you tell us about this armor behind you? Yes. Yeah, so um, <laughs> I've, uh, I love. I want it. I want it too much. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so after, as I say, I've been reenacting since I was 15. Um, I did a long time with the sealed knot doing 17th century reenactment, um, but my heart is medieval. And the more re research I did, it was always going to be medieval history. As my, I said, my PhD was about display on the medieval battlefield. So it was about the use of heraldry, banners, um, trumpets and music and how that worked practically, but also culturally and socially. But another aspect of it was about how wearing armor impacts on um, the psychology of the combatant. So how wearing armor makes you feel big and scary, how it divorces you from people around you, that sort of thing. And the only way I could really talk with any um, authority on that was actually to wear the stuff. So um, this, is, this is a research tool. This is called okay. experiential learning. It's not a midlife crisis, no matter what my life <laughs> is. Um, but this is my 1350s harness. Um, okay, so please. it's... Um, it's based on an effigy just south of uh, Hereford here in, in England, um, dating to 1350. There are bits of it that are drawn from um, surviving examples in Germany. Um, and it's wonderful. I've, yeah, I've had amazing. it now for a number of years. I, I, I get to wear it now. I do arming the night displays. Again, this is all part of what I do, part of my research, but also part of my hobby. And so I do arming the night displays. That's what, I don't fight in it. Um, okay. And there are two reasons for that. One, I've done medieval com. I've done uh, reenactment combat um, before and it doesn't really do it for me for various mm -hmm. reasons it's not quite right and secondly I can't afford anyone to dent this stuff um, yeah, I'm imagine. not I'm not a medieval knight who can basically sort of afford this highly expensive thing and then have yeah, someone yeah. It with a sword so um, <laughs> yeah and I can hear lots of reenact I can hear lots of medieval reenactors on your uh, audience now sniggering at that, and it's like how precious is <laughs> But that's it. That's the way it is, I'm afraid. Um, yes, yeah, so and that's what's behind me. So that's part of that. If you want to know more about the armor, then you need to come to the website and have a look at my blog, where I've got bits of information about. So my blog has. Yeah, talk to us about the blog and where we can find you. I will have all the links on the description, but uh, just give us a. Yeah. So um, the website is historian in harness co.uk um, and that gives you my bio so it tells you a bit about my my research it tells you about um, my tour guiding and sort of the historical interpretation work uh, it tells you about the books I've published and all of that sort of thing and it has a section on wargaming and it gives you that's where you'll find the rules blood and horse droppings is a link in under under medieval wargaming um, but I also run a blog on there which is every four months, five months. I'm not a particularly good blogger, I'm sorry. Um, you'll get a piece that just is something that's caught my eye, interested me. So it could be um, a piece on the coronation swords from the recent coronation. It could be um, a bit about my armor. I've been wearing it a lot the last over the last summer. I've learned 
a lot from wearing it. So I've kind of thrown in six things that I've learned from wearing armor this summer. Um, but it could be the Agincourt stuff. Um, so I've got a how to refight Agincourt in there as a blog. So there's all sorts of bits and pieces. Hopefully there's something in there that you'll enjoy. But if it's nothing else, if you just want the rules, it's historianinharness.co.uk and then navigate through medi through wargaming, medieval wargaming, and you'll find the rules there as a download. The rules are a PDF. There's also a download uh, of the cards with examples for the Wars of the Roses and the Hundred Years' War, and a download to produce the stickers for the war dice if you want to do that. So everything you need is there. Oh, and the other thing that's hosted on there is a crown of paper, which is the perfect captain's uh, campaign rules because they work really well as a campaign. Perfect Captain are no longer supporting their, their rule sets, but they allowed people to host their rules, providing you weren't charging for them. So they're free for you to have if you want them. So there's a lot of material there for you to go with. So have a look at the website, please. Yes, so we will have the description. Uh, by far, one final question. Are you, where are you planning to go with the rules? Are you planning to uh, add, add some things during the coming years i don't know um, you have anything in mind and maybe battles uh, uh, that uh, can be played with your rules and give you know a description of the, the units that can be used are you thinking that to develop them or this is uh, one off finished and uh, next project next project um i'm taking a bit of a favor because i'm on a new project so i just finished over developing and, and honing a set of skirmish rules for the Hundred Years' War, oh. um, that I am 99% sure one of the War Games companies is going to pick up. Now, I haven't signed anything at the moment, so I'm going to keep That's quiet. That's very nice. There are, you know, there's a set of, there's a set of Hundred Years' War skirmish rules coming, which will have much the same feel and flavor as blood and horse dropping. So if you like the sort of things that I talk about for that, then I think you're going to enjoy um, these these skirmish rules as well. So oh. watch this. So space. another interview coming up. Another interview coming up yeah, in the future. But... Yeah. <laughs> hopefully, I think hopefully by next summer they'll be out, and we'll be we'll be talking okay. about them before. Now. That's very um, good. So that's the that's the project that's I'm focused on at the moment. Uh, with regard blood and horse droppings, I'd like to do Cressy and put it out as a as a potential game, and then perhaps I'll drip feed into the blog as and when some more scenarios, maybe a little bit of a mini campaign yeah. type thing. I've got some ideas for that. Um, I'm running. I'm about to run in through the winter a mini campaign with um, again a local a local gaming buddy, and we're going to do a hundred years war campaign with a mixture of skirmish action and big battles as well, which I'm quite excited to kind of run. So that's good. Um, I'm online, so you, there is a contact sheet. If you if you have questions about the rules, you can reach out to me, and I'm happy to talk about the rules. And I, I, a couple of people have signed, sent me tweaks where they've changed them to a suit themselves because they like particular things that weren't in the rules, and they think actually we we prefer this. And it's like fine, good, okay. You, the the rules are free to take; they're free for you to adapt. I don't I don't have a problem yeah. with that. Um, the other thing I might do, possibly, maybe. Um, is look at other periods. So at the moment they do Wars of the Roses and Hundred Years War. The mechanisms, the base mechanisms are so straightforward, they could be applied to any other sort of pre-gunpowder period. Right. Um, yeah. And I've been talking to a couple of sort of Twitter, I'm quite big on wargaming Twitter, on, on sort of the wargaming community and Twitter in terms of chatting to people. And people have been asking about um, the post-Roman period for example, um, and yeah. how you might make these fit that. Um, I'd also quite like to do something around the Crusades, because I think the Crusades is a fascinating period. I think there's a lot yeah. to go in there, but I don't think it has been done particularly... Sorry, it's not been done to my to my taste, let's put it that way, because wargaming <laughs> rules, it's not about good rules, bad rules, it's about rules that work to your particular taste, how you particularly exactly. think they work. Um, and I don't think I've seen a set of rules that deal with the Crusades, again, that work for me. Now, I'm not sure how well they'll work for the, that, and I would need to have a look, because the way in which troops are raised and organised uh, amongst um, the Muslim realm, as opposed to the Crusading realm, is quite different. So I'm, I'm, I'll be interested to have a play, but I might need to, that will take some time to think about. So we'll see, we'll see. But That's, that's, that's a lot <laughs> in the pipeline, a lot. Yeah. Um, Rob, thank you so much for joining us. I really pleasure to talking to you again. And uh, hopefully when you have time, I know you're busy, we can chat about medieval warfare and have so many questions about medieval battles and how they fought. We we'll discuss this offline one day, you remember. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for explaining the rules. 
and hopefully we be, be, you'll be back here with the new rules and we can discuss about this new project of you. Uh, of course, you're always welcome here. Um, guys, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this chat with Rob. Uh, any questions, uh, you can find the Rob in his, all the, all the links of his website will be uh, in the description of the video and anything you want to comment under the video, I, I will answer. And Rob follows the channel, he can answer as well. Uh, thank you so much for watching and bye-bye guys.